Thank you, Sandra. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Hour of Technology. Thank you for uh, being with us in LACNIC Statistics. Uh, we have many interesting topics to share with you. First of all, I wanted to uh, tell you about La Hora de la Tecnología, the Hour of Technology, where LACNIC shares uh, research and technology that we consider may be of interest for the community. So throughout the session, you'll be able to ask questions in the Q&A panel. And at the end, we're going to try to answer all the questions possible. So let us start with a presentation by Guillermo Sicileo, who's a research and development leader in infrastructure of the internet. Guillermo will tell us about the importance of some named servers that are part of, of the structure infrastructure of the net uh, of internet in the region and what data we can obtain from them. Thank you, Elisa. Let's be brief. Well, as we all know, DNS is a key pillar of the architecture of the internet. This is something that we have mentioned more than once. What type of, its, of data does uh, the DNS uh, have? Well, on the one hand, we have uh, qu direct queries uh, for, because of to get an IP address based, uh, starting with the name or also the reverse queries that are done in the zones in Adro ARPA and IP6 ARPA to obtain a name based on uh, the IP address. How can we analyze how this infrastructure behaves? The DNS information is distributed as an example of a database that is distributed globally. DNS has different components. You have the resolvers that each client has to resolve the names, recursive servers, and authoritative servers. Within this architecture, there are some services that are more important, such as the root servers, the root of the DNS, that um, it went back then the authoritative service that uh, take the zones of the CCTLDs or the TLDs, for instance, in our region, we are interested in knowing how the service are that uh, uh, reach uh, that, that take um, the countries. Uh, and then we have the public recursive servers. These are some parts where we can divide the infrastructure of the DNS and what I want to tell you, this is an introduction, but I want to show you what data we are taking from this. For instance, we have a site that is measuring a root service. It's an interactive site, and you can see different data here. I, you have some charts, but you can see it here in this link. These are the time to respond uh, in each uh, root server in the different countries in the region. And so you see how the times uh, for response, response times improve depending on the root server. So we can determine the averages and the median values of time to respond for each root server or from uh, times to respond uh, for each country to each root server. We, this comes from a study that we did with Hugo Sainado last year. And uh, this is in uh, our site. You can see it. This is a part, but in addition to um, the root zone, what else do you have? Well, Salvador of the IXP of Peru uh, presented, uh, gave a presentation saying how we access uh, the name servers uh, for Peru. And the site of the root servers is available for every country, so you can see it. But in addition to the root zone, there are other top-level domains, such as the, well, the TLDs that are important in the uh, resolution of uh, names, and some root servers also provide these zones. So we don't have much control about that. 
But uh, the country domains, yes, the countries in the region, most of them have infrastructure by um, of a, a wavy cast of a server, but very often they are in lack TLD, the any cast cow that takes the zones of many CC TLDs in the region. And we are going to show you how we take the data. And also reverse zones are important. And LACNIC has the reverse zones that correspond to the reverse ranks. Um, and this is important because every time there's a connection to, uh, to uh, a machine or any transaction, the servers consult those reverse zones to determine the name associated to the IP. So believe it or not, there is a lot of traffic toward those areas. And these areas too are in LACTLD. And uh, we are starting to deploy new copies in well, the LACTLD cloud, both by the CCTLDs and the reverse zones was important. So we conducted a uh, work very similar to that of root servers, but now measuring the times to access the service of LACTLD. These times to respond were used based on a ripe probe. It's an, it's an external measurement. It has nothing to do with anything of LACTLD, but it's a, a measurement that anyone can do. It's like a ping. Only that you're using the probes of RIPE uh, Atlas and uh, you can um, rank the countries with the best uh, response and uh, the ones that are slower. And he, then you can see what you can do. If you can put the name of like TLD, if it's a, a matter of the routing, sometimes there are nodes to countries. There are countries that have like TLD nodes, but the times to respond are not good. And that maybe has to do with the way the operators are interconnected. So we should study it more in detail. But to begin with this information as to how you reach the root servers and some of the CCDLDs is available there. Another important piece of information that we have about uh, um, these uh, node servers, I imagine that you know the term CCTLD. These are the top level domains for each country, BR, etc. MX. They are, are they protected by ROAs? Which of those networks are? In the uh, Fort Monitoring Project, we have a part that is critical infrastructure that deals with this. In this part, we can see which of the networks where the name servers are uh, located of the CCDLDs, those networks are protected by ROAs. There we have, for instance, in the case of Brazil, we can see some of the name servers are DNS, uh, .vr, DNS, uh, VR. So in, here you see that the announcements that appear are all valid in the RPKI. But for the DDNS, there's an announcement that here it says that it's uh, the origin is invalid uh, by RPKI. Certainly here there's a, a narrow way missing. You can see this for different countries. In this, uh, that's for Brazil, but in the fourth project, you can see it for different countries. In addition to that, the people of CSERT, Graciela and Guillermo, have studied uh, open resolvers in the region. This uh, and there, I leave the information available, but you can get in touch with them if you want uh, more information. You have two minutes left. Yes, I'm about done. So the idea here is just to show that we are seeing the issue of the resolvers, but we are certainly going to continue to study. Why did we, um, this presentation is uh, here, we'll leave you the links and we invite you to see that information and visit the sites that I mentioned and contact us uh, with, if you have any doubts. Why are we doing this? Well, because the DNS are a very important part, it's a pillar of the internet and we want to provide tools for operators and researchers in the region so that they may, uh, all the data is available if you wish to 
research further. And it also permits uh, the operators to make informed decisions, routing, etc. And of course, to have a better understanding of the stability and robustness of the DNS. So that's all. Eli, Elisa, thank you. Thank you, Guillermo. Very interesting information. And as you mentioned, we invite you all to visit the sites that they showed to get more information. So now we have Jasmine Suarez, who is a software developer at LACNIC, and she will tell you how to use the registry app to, to manage your ROAs. It's an app that uh, is a uh, uh, that the main objective is the massive management of resources available in the Milaknik platform and seeks to integrate the customer's systems with Milaknik to make management of the assigned resources uh, more simple. Thank you, Elisa. Now, to see the management of ROAs, we are going to see the, an interface. To access the app, you need to send uh, an email here to Hostmaster with a uh, org ID or organization ID, name of contact, uh, email, and the GBG key. The interface is structured as follows. In the upper part, you have general data of the app, then uh, the authentication button, and then you have each of the services. Before you execute any service of the API, you need to authenticate. And there you have to put the user's name and uh, the password, the client ID, and uh, uh, each of the scopes corresponding to each of the services of Blackmeek. The services are grouped by functions and in different colors, independently of the HTTP service. So you can see the HTTP, um, the endpoint of the service and the name of the service. When you deploy a service, you can see a general description of the service and uh, the parameters sector where you have all the list of the data you need to execute the service. In the upper part, we have the trade out uh, button that will execute to edit the services and try it. And once you've edited the data, you just have to click on execute. Then we have the response section where you list potential responses that this service could provide. Some examples would be 200 when it's correctly uh, executed 400 when there is incorrect data, 401 if it's not authorized, and 404 if they don't find the element. So for ROA management, we have four services, obtaining, creating, editing, and revoking the ROAs. First, we'll see obtaining the ROA. To get information about the ROA, we have three different parameters. You can uh, ask us uh, why I, ASN, ID, and prefix. So let's see for ASN uh, 28,000. We execute and it responds uh, code 200, but the, the here there are no ROAs, so that is empty. So let's create an ROA for this uh, ASN. We select create ROA, we put the, the data we need. Uh, for we need the ASN and name reference uh, reference name. We we'll put test demo and the resources. So we're going to be using resource 210. To 10, well, that number there with a maximum length of 24. We execute the service and we receive this in return 200 and zero of RPKI. So the ROA was correctly created. We are going to check whether the ROA was created for this prefix. So we consult for the prefix 2010, etc. that we used recently. We, ex we execute and it returns us the ROA in the demo test that we just uh, created. We, let's uh, create an ROA with two resources for the same ASN. We put test two. We put the data necessary, we execute, and it returns code 200. 
So we check for that ASN, that uh, 28,000, that they, it has these two ROAs. And indeed, it shows the test uh, demo ROA and uh, the second ROA that we created. You can also revoke ROAs, but for that, you need the serial number of the ROA. Let's revoke the uh, demo test uh, uh, ROA. We take the serial number, we select the service, uh, revoke ROA, then trade out. You click on trade out, then you put the serial number in the parameters and we execute. It returns the code 200 and now we'll check that this ROA was eliminated, deleted properly. We consult again for ASN 28000 and here it shows that for this ASN it has the ROA test 2 because the demo test was properly eliminated. So this is how we can manage the ROAs from um, Milaknik and you can also um, we we could do it another way. You copy the put the command there, and you only have to execute it in the terminal and, and Postman too. But for that, you need extra configuration. If you wish to uh, use Postman, write to my um, uh, to my uh, email yasmin at laknik.net, and I'll be very happy. To help. So, Ellie, thank you. Thank you, Jasmine. That was very clear. Let me remind you that you can uh, uh, ask questions in the Q&A panel and at the end of all the presentations, we'll read as many as we can. Now, let's go on with another presentation by Guillermo Sicileo, in this case, the local interconnection in the LACNIC region. We, you know that VGP is the routing protocol that is used to interconnect the networks in the internet. And although we have a lot of data to analyze the routing information globally, what can we know about the local interconnections within the countries? So Guillermo is going to tell us. Thank you, Eli. Indeed, What Ellie says is like that. We have a lot of information on the global tables, but very little on the local tables or what is happening in the interconnections at a country level. So we are trying to work. This is the same introduction. Well, uh, today we talked about DNS, but BGP is another great pillar of the internet and many of the actions in the CNIC aim at strengthening BGP and DNS. In addition, we also made some comments in the tutorial that the internet is evolving from a centralized architecture to a decentralized uh, architecture where the content is uh, displaced towards the edges. And this is seen to, you see, the improvements when we have more interconnection locally because the BGP is more stable and with a better performance. We have uh, less latency, better connectivity, more stable connections. And here the IXPs are a very relevant player when we speak of local interconnections. What information do we have in route, routes of BGP? Well, there are several with global information. What do these um, initiatives collect? Dumps gives you complete tables with a daily frequency, usually three times a day. And you can find the global table uh, seen from different points of the world and frequent updates every five minutes. Uh, this is what is used in the Ford um, um, project to analyze and report this five minute update. Some of the best known initiatives of the BGP collectors are Route Views, RIPE RISA, PCH, Solario. So these are uh, have been here for a long time. What is the problem or what do we still need? They are not enough for our region. If you look at Road Views, this is the focused uh, to the United States. Uh, collectors that are in RIPE and RIS have about 
information about Europe, or at least from the Northern Hemisphere. We have information of the IXPs of PCH that contains a lot of information, not every one, but there is a lot of information there. Another problem is that the format information is not always uniform, it's not standardized, right? RIS and PCH do not use the same format. In some cases, we do not have these collectors, so sometimes you have to access through Telnet or HTTP. And the vision of the routing information for the region is only partial information. As I was saying globally, we this is what we have. This is a site that analyzes things based on the global BGP tables, mostly from RIPE RIS, analyzes many of the features and the status of the routing tables. Here we have the IP4, IPv6 prefixes, the prefix length, the number of prefixes. Traffic, upstream, and so on. This is information available here, and you can find more information, as I was saying. So what can we add here? What are we doing in order to improve that information? We want to deploy BGP collectors in the IXPs of the region. And that is what we are doing and also collaborating with similar projects in order to maintain one single format. Ultimately, this is about the same. It's about providing tools to the operators and the investigators of the region to facilitate routing problem detection. If we have information on the IXPs and we can achieve, uh, obtain that information more closely to real time, we can use other tools that are just, have been designed, such as BGP Alerter, which Maximo Candela has shared with us more than once. So we could start using that associated to the, associated to the IXPs. And we also have information on the size of the BGP tables, on the BGP updates in real time, visibility of the prefixes. All this will provide better understanding on the stability and robustness of this. This map shows some of the collectors that we included and also the PCH collectors, which we are also taking into account. This has been part of a joint initiative with LACIX and Internet Society in the sense of installing services in the IXPs, including RPKI validators, reverse DNS and route service, and also BGP collectors. Information that we can start sharing with you, although this has not been published yet, show the following. He were taking Cabase from Buenos Aires, the IXP from Costa Rica, Cricks, and the IXP from Paraguay. And what we can see is the number of paths announced, prefixes that were originated in IPv4 and IPv6, as well as the origin autonomous systems. Here you can see Cabase is older, and this shows what IX, each IXP is receiving. We also have the average prefix length and the announced paths. This is relevant in the following sense. We can see whether IPv4 is closer to slash 24 or if it is shorter. Here we have in IPv6, for example, those in Cabase tend to be longer. The average packed path length in BGP, in this case, Cabase also has a longer path length. Origin autonomous systems viewed by IXPs from other countries, for example, in CRICS, we see that there are autonomous systems from Peru, from Brazil, from the Aryan region, from RIPE, from Uruguay, and from Panama that are announced. In the IXP, Cabase contains many from Brazil. There are also quite a number from Arian and from RIPE. 
he corrects himself. This one here was the IXB Paraguay, and this is Crick's down here, where they have a lot from Arin, some from Ripe, and from Guatemala, Nicaragua, and other countries. One of the other things that surprised us is if prepend in the IXPs is used. We have here no Rosario Neuquén. This is the one from Mexico, from Yucatan. This is Crix. This is Chile, Guatemala, Paraguay, and Buenos Aires. What we can see here is that there is this is a prepend and the frequency. We see that many have three prepends, four, five, and there's one with 16 over here even. So this is interesting because this provides information on how announcements are made to the IXPs. Naturally, one might tend to think that prepend is not done towards the IXPs because one wishes to prefer the IXPs, but here there is prepend carried out. And this other slide is very interesting. This shows the percentage of ASNs in each country that do announcement in IXP. Here we have Cabase Buenos Aires, for example. This here is the number of autonomous systems announced to the IXPs and are in the global tables. This is 76%. This is all right because the intersection between the autonomous systems in the IXPs and the autonomous systems that are only in the global collector are more than 70% of the autonomous system of that country. Regarding the prefixes, they are here. This is for IPv4 and this is for IPv6. 50% of the prefixes are announced in the IXP. Crix also has a very good situation. Although they, although they have less autonomous systems regarding IPv4 prefixes, 70% is announced. In IPv6, 63% of the prefixes are only announced globally. In the case of Paraguay, these are some of the most recent ones, of the newest ones. So they still have to improve these numbers because here the number of autonomous systems announced in the IXPs is smaller. In the case of IPv6, it might seem as if this were a recurrent problem because in many places it is worse than IPv4. So that would be all the same as before. We invite you to check the information. Please contact us if you wish to do peering with the collector we have at RIPE. This is multi-hop. If you wish to deploy a collector, BTP collector and IXP, or if you wish to deploy and other services for IXP, which is what we're doing with LAC IX and Internet Society, please contact us. And this is something that I already mentioned, what we have below. So that would be all. Thank you very much. And back to you, Eli. Excellent. Thank you. Very useful information. And once again, we encourage you to review this information and to contact Guillermo if you have any questions or you can ask, ask your questions here. So now we're almost uh, at the end of this section. We have a presentation from Guillermo Pereira. He is security analyst at LACNIC CCERT and he'll give us an advance of a progress project carried out by CCERT for internet protocols that could be susceptible to be used in DDoS attacks in the region. Thank you, Eli. Thank you to everyone who is with us today. One of the projects at CERT as a proactive measure is that we decided to conduct this study. I will give you an advance of the results of the study. This is a study, as you were saying, of the protocols that enable DDoS attacks in the region. This is a joint project between LACNIC CERT and the search of the National University of La Plata. As Chicho was saying, Guillermo Sicileo was saying in the previous presentation, not in the previous one, but the first presentation, last year we presented the project of the TNS Open Resolvers Protocol that resolved recursive 
queries. And this year we decided to expand these protocols that amplify the attacks more. This is other topics I will be covering, the DDoS attacks with amplification, the protocols we decided to try to mitigate this, what we did during the project, as well as some preliminary results. The denial of service attacks attempt to vulnerate the availability of the system or to make it slower if we wish to access the website and the website is not available or it is slower than usual and makes access difficult that would not be good for information security so those that is what the attackers tried to do and as was mentioned yesterday at the last presentation which i encourage you to read it which is regarding the denial of service attacks for last year there are many vectors that are used and among these we have the protocols that are open in the internet and amplify the response when we did the query to the protocol then these amplify the response with a lot of information and this is how what it looks like in the graph that i'm sharing with you let us assume that the attacker controls several machines it is a bot or a botnet a network of vulnerated systems and this example is for open resolvers but the same applies to the other protocols that i will be referring to so this machine changes the origin IP for the victim's IP, it does IP spoofing, it does a query to the open resolver or to the open protocol that then amplifies the response and the victim is then affected. There are several protocols that amplify the response and are open in the internet. This is a list of these protocols. For the study, we selected some that are very much present in the region. region. We selected DNS, we choose open resolvers again, NTP, we divided this into two commands that can be executed when amplifies the response more than the other, NTP monitor and version to monitor whether the server is up. We also selected SSDP which is one of the ones that is most open. The DNS and SSDP are the two protocols that are most present in the region. And the other one we selected was ChargeN, which has an amplification of 158 times the original response. And I'm going to leave the link so you can look at the table. So the objective of this project was like in the other projects we had at the CSERT, namely to improve the security levels of the systems that use the IP resources of the LACNIC region in order to collaborate with the stability and resilience of the internet and minimizing the possible use of these in DDoS attacks. Some of the actions we carried out are the following. First of all, we identified the systems that expose these open protocols in the region, and then to warn those who are affected. Not only to warn them to correct this and forcing them to correct things, but the idea was to jointly figure out a solution, both from the CERT of La Plata and with the CERT of LACNIC. We have the experience of closing these protocols and that was the idea precisely, namely to together share our experience with them because we know how the other operators correct these. So we organized uh, several meetings with some, we exchanged emails and this was well accepted. These are some of the statistics we obtained. The majority of these protocols, of these open protocols, are concentrated in only few organizations. This is how we selected the organizations to contact them. 
sometimes it's concentrated in just one NTP version is in eight different organizations. We tried to select countries. Some of these organizations are present in the same country. We tried to expand to other countries in order to be present in other parts. In three organizations, 60%. So we try to contact those organizations. Um, DNS is uh, more uniform, the resolvers. It's, so we chose the top five of the organizations to work together. And uh, Charjan, too. We said, well, we chose five organizations. And this is the one that we could correct better, exchanging mails. We managed to eliminate the organization that was present in Chile. And there are a lot of public statistics. I'm only going to show those of the shadow server. There are thousands of IPs with open resolvers that uh, the attackers could use to execute their attacks. In uh, SSDP, there are some countries that we are trying to uh, remove from this top 20. And this is before and after, as I told you, of the charge and protocol. Charge is a protocol to generate characters to see that the connections are well. So you query the protocol, and the protocol gives you a lot of uh, random characters. Sometimes it's uh, the alphabet or numbers. And so it generates a big response. Before 28th September, you see that Chile was there, and after the 28th, we managed to remove Chile from that top list, uh, exchanging mails with the with uh, the organizations. So, future steps: we are going to publish this project, and we are going to organize a webinar for those those of you who are interested. If you wish, if you're interested in. Uh, uh, not appearing in those statistics. If you come to the webinar, we can help you. You can write us CSERT uh, at LACNIC if, if you want to know whether you're in, in any of these listings. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Guillermo. We have some minutes left for questions. There are none in the panel, but now we invite you. Since we have the speakers here, if you want to ask any questions, you can do so. In the chat, Cesar Augusto Camacho had written, can you give us the link of the DNS teacher of your first presentation? All the presentations will be available on the website of LACNIC, but maybe we can send you some links now. Yes, let's uh, show that uh, of uh, our website and there you find it. Thank you. Wonderful. There, this, uh, there you have the four presentations under the Hour of Technology. And, all right, let's send the information. That was very good. There you have one. Andres. Andres. Um, sorry. Uh, Pugauco says, Chicho, I just saw your presentation and I have a couple of doubts. What uh, base of prefixes did you use for the Cavasis study? In the case of Kavase, we use the PCH collector. That is the only one that we have information. And the prefixes are based on the studies that we did on the global DGP tables classified. Last year, we did that with the BGP LAC site 
that is for every country, how many pre prefixes are announced and uh, which are they in the autonomous systems at a global level. And that in contrast with what is in a, the server of the root server in the server of PCH that is connected so the intersection between the global table and the local table of Cavasi gives us the autonomous systems that are in both places, those in Cavasi and the other, or the prefixes. In some of the IXPs, we did it using our collectors and in others, cabases. Wonderful. Una pregunta más. Ahora sí. Bueno. Bueno, este, well, muchas... there are no more questions. So thank you all for having shared this time with us. I hope you found it useful. And now I give the floor who will close this session. Muchas gracias.